So in today's episode, what we're going to be doing is looking at music theory from the standpoint of a more integrated musical experience. Up till now, we've been looking very much at component parts of music, generally in isolation. What we want to do now is start to see how these things might fit together. And what we're going to be working from is the idea of melody. We'll be working with, to start out with one very particular melody and then adding some others later on. What we're going to be doing also is using melody as a kind of aperture into the interaction of some key new ideas in music theory for us. Now, one of them will be a little bit older idea, the idea of interval. We're going to be developing that to a slightly new level today. Uh, and then what we're also going to be interested in is the context for interval, which is something that we call mode. So what I'm going to be working from is a melody that's usually associated with a composer, Johann Sebastian Bach. He wrote uh, a fugue uh, based on this melody, and that's uh, an idea that we'll be getting to in episode 11. What are fugues? Why would a composer like Bach want to write such a thing? We're just going to be looking at the melody itself. It's actually a melody that Bach got from another composer, a Renaissance composer named Vittoria, and that original melody had a text that went with it. Now, I'm not going to tell you what the text is right away. I want to see if maybe in some senses we could guess what the text had to say in the original song. But what I'll do for you right now is just play this melody so we get it into our ears. To be honest, when I listen to a melody like that, I don't just hear notes and intervals, I hear feelings in some sense. I get a sense that this melody is about something, that it's trying to create a mood of some kind. Now, obviously one thing I could do is go straight to the text and see, well, what did the original composer have in mind? What words were they trying to set? But before doing that, I want to see how much information I can't get out of the melody itself. And so one of the things that we do as musicians is just look at the features of a melody. So I notice, as I look at it written out on the board up there, that there are a lot of different rhythms being used, a lot of different pitches, there are a lot of different intervals that are there. And I wonder if there's some way in which the sequence of intervals that are formed by melodic motion might tell me a story of some kind. Now, usually when we come into melodic analysis, we start out by looking at the sort of features that immediately come uh, into view. I notice some kind of big leap that the melody is taking. I see a lot of melodic motion that's kind of densely packed, and I see another leap that's downwards, and then a leap up and then it looks like a slow descent of some kind. Well, one thing that I can do straight away is recognize that as a melody unfolds, some kind of motion or choreography is taking place, and what notation is capturing is the kind of trace or profile left by that melodic motion. So melodic motion produces a visible trace that we call melodic contour, and I can analyze that melodic contour in two basic ways in terms of what we call stepwise motion and motion by leap. So for example, if I look at the melody as a whole, there do seem to be important segments of it where the notes appear to be coming right next to each other. That is to say that when the notes are being written out, they're moving from an adjacent line to an adjacent space or vice versa. So I can see that here. and also over here. So stepwise motion in this sense is a little bit of a broad term because we already know from episode two that you can distinguish musical steps into half steps and whole steps that produce semitones and whole tones. So stepwise, for the most part, is gonna be a broad term to describe moving by whole tones and semitones. Although sometimes another kind of interval can squeeze in there. We'll talk about that later on in the course. But 
I see that most of this melody appears to be dominated by the stepwise motion. Opposed to that, I see these leaps taking place, right? And what's of interest to me right away when I look at it visually is that there seems to be one leap upwards that's repeated downwards over here, and then a smaller leap is taking place. So if I look at that interval and that interval, visually they appear to be slightly different in size, and also my ear hears that. If I play that, 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 I'm hearing two intervals. And when I play them right beside each other like that, it seems melodically significant to me that a smaller interval is coming afterwards. Now, I'm noticing one other thing that we want to explore a little bit more in the next stage of this discussion, and that is this E is looking pretty darn isolated in these places. And it's almost like the original composer was wanting to choreograph melodic motion in a way that isolates this pitch E, E4. It eventually gets connected to later on. But there's going to be a little story that I want to tell about this because it's rather like this stepwise motion is kind of, in a way, elaborating that pitch B, right? And that B sounds like a relatively dominant pitch in some sense. So what we're going to be doing first is talking about the fact that the next time the melody leaps up, it can't get all the way up to the B. And what I want to be able to do is describe that in more precise terms. I can say, yes, it doesn't leap up high enough, but how high does it leap? How high did the melody leap down before? Up to this point in time, we can actually clearly distinguish between types of musical steps, stepwise motion, uh, the whole tone, the semitone, but we haven't developed a language for describing motion by leap, intervals that are larger than a step, a, a semitone or a whole tone. And that's the next thing we're going to want to be able to do. And we want to do it in a way that's different from how we were introduced to the concept of interval in episode one. There we were working with ratios, and ratios don't always speak to our arithmetic sense of interval size, right? If I have a ratio of uh, one to two and another ratio of two to three, which is the larger interval? Or how about two to three compared to three to four? Now, as it happens, if this were tuned in a very special way called just tuning or just intonation, I'll be discussing that in episode eight, if this were played on an instrument or sung in a way that's tuned to just intonation, uh, this would be the two to three ratio and this would be the, the three to four ratio. But that isn't really capturing for me in a very di uh, direct and arithmetic way the difference in interval sizes. So we actually have a very simple way of describing interval sizes in terms of how they appear on the musical staff. So remember that any musical staff, regardless of the clef that's going to be applied to it, is based on a collection of pitch classes A through G, right? A, B, C, D, E, F, G, right? And what that means is that this represents, in a sense, already a kind of stepwise grid, if you will. There's a term that we get from ancient Greek, diatonikos, uh, by the tone, uh, tone by tone, through the tones. For the ancient Greeks, uh, tones could be in, come in many different sizes. Nowadays, for the most part, we just deal with two sizes of tone, uh, the semitone and the whole tone. The Greeks had more, but it's the idea that you set up something that moves or can be appreciated tone by tone by tone, right? And so we have a derivation from that in modern theory that we call diatonic. Now this is a term that we're going to get to know much better over the next couple of episodes and then likewise again when we come to the, the concept of key uh, later on in this course. But right now all I want us to think about is that what the staff represents is a kind of 
diatonic grit, if you will. So if I'm trying to measure intervals against that grid, what I'm coming up with are diatonic interval sizes. Now what's significant about this is that the diatonic interval size is quite limited in some ways, and I'll be very specific about that in a few more minutes, but all I want us to think about right now is that we are going to be measuring intervals as they would appear on a musical staff, regardless of the use of accidentals. Whether accidentals are there or not isn't going to matter. And here's how it works. If I look at an interval like this, E to B, I can say that interval encompasses five diatonic positions on the staff. One, two, three, four, five. If I look at this interval, E to A, that interval encompasses four diatonic positions. E, F, G, A. And again, those could turn out to be F sharps, F flats, G sharps, G flats. I don't care. All I'm thinking about is that underlying grid. And so this thing has a fiveness to it, that thing has a fourness to it. And instead of saying the interval five and the interval four, what we say uh, in music theory is something that sounds like a fraction, but we don't mean it that way. We say this kind of interval is a fifth, and that type of interval is a fourth. So it sounds like a fourth, a quarter, or something, a fifth, a fifth, or something. That's not what it means. It actually means a sort of arithmetic uh, grid, if you will. This interval takes place on top of five possible diatonic locations for pitches. This one, this fourth, uh, covers four possible diatonic locations. So now we start to have a language that can be applied to all sorts of sizes of interval, not just leaps, because of course, stepwise motion, these things can also be referred to in diatonic terms. We can call them seconds, okay? So what you then might think you want to do is get really good at quickly counting how uh, far apart these notes are in a melody to determine what the interval is. But that's really cumbersome because Honestly, if you're a practicing musician, uh, much of the time what you are doing is reading music at sight, trying to take in information as quickly as possible. And if you had to, for each and every single interval, count up all the lines and spaces on the staff that the interval occupied, uh, you're going to be very slow at it. So there's a way in which we can cut to the chase and just recognize things at sight. There are two basic types of diatonic interval with respect to their appearance on the staff. I call them symmetrical and asymmetrical. And I'll give you an example of each. Over here, I'm calling these symmetrical intervals because both components of the interval are on the same feature of the, the staff. Either they are both on lines or they're both on spaces. So these clearly are unisons. These intervals, both on spaces or both on lines that are directly adjacent to each other, we can call these thirds. One, two, three, one, two, three. Here, we have an intervening line or an intervening space with the other components of the interval also on that same graphic feature. These are fifths, and over here we have sevenths. So what you notice is that these odd-numbered uh, diatonic interval sizes are the symmetrical ones. And it's kind of handy because you can just glance at a melody like this. I see both of these components of the interval on lines. There's an intervening line. Without having to count anything, I can just recognize that as a fifth. Right? Uh, likewise, I might come across an interval that's quite a bit larger. And again, if I notice this underlying graphic symmetry, both components of the interval are on lines. Uh, it looks too big to be a fifth. Uh, this is the seventh. So this is something that I don't have to count up. I can just recognize it immediately. But if I look over here, right away I also get another piece of information. That is, here I have an interval where one component is on a line, the other is on a space, immediately I know what it could not be. It couldn't be any of these intervals. It couldn't be a third, a fifth, 
a seventh or a unison, obviously. It has to be part of another category, and those are the asymmetrical uh, diatonic intervals. So our friends, the uh, whole tone and the semitone, those are examples of seconds, and here you can see that the components are immediately on an adjacent line and space. For fourths, there's a little more space in between. Sixths, I always find that a challenging word to say, a little bit further apart, and then finally, eighths, or here's a term that I can finally properly introduce. If you call those things octaves, octave refers to the idea of the diatonic interval size of an eighth, right? So seconds, fourths, sixths, and octaves are examples of the asymmetric intervals. Again, I could look at something like this. Right away, I recognize it's not one of the symmetrical ones. It's going to be one of these. And then in my mind's eye, if I have this picture of these relative sizes, basically what I'm doing is training myself to make an educated guess. That actually can be very accurate. To me, that's too far apart to be a second, not far enough apart to be a sixth. It's right in the middle of the asymmetric intervals. That's, that's a fourth, right? And certainly nowhere close to being an octave. So now, if I look at a musical score and I know about this basic distinction, I just think about diatonic interval size, I can recognize that instantly. I don't have to count anything. I can just see it and know exactly what it should be. And what will qualify that later on will be the context in which these intervals take place. Why is that important? Because as powerful as this way of reading intervals is, it does face one very obvious limitation. Diatonic means it's based on this idea of tone by tone by tone. In our context, something that means a mixture of whole tones and semitones. Therefore, the grid that we're measuring things on is unequal. And what that means is that where the diatonic interval occurs will shape our aesthetic impression. I'm going to give you a very basic example of that. I've got two intervals here and here. Both of them I would identify as fifths, okay? But if I put a clef down like that, right away I've characterized them in a particular way. I've located them somewhere on this uneven underlying diatonic grid. I'm going to play the two intervals for you. Here's the A to E. And here's the B to F. And since I have this new term available to me, I can tell you that I will now play them an octave lower. Right. So if I compare those two intervals, one of them to my ear sounds consonant and the other sounds dissonant. That is a very significant um, change in the character of the fifth, depending on where that fifth is located. So what do I mean by saying things like depending on where it's located? Well, literally, if I spell it out for us, I see that to get from one component of the interval to the other, there's a way in which I can apply a uniform form of measure. It's not diatonic. We call it chromatic for reasons I'll talk about in episode seven, but it's literally going up by semitone. And to get from one component of the interval to the other, whether I go from bottom to top or top to bottom, I'm going to end up with the same semitone count. So here's lower component, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Or if I start it up here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This fifth actually encompasses seven semitone steps, okay? What about this fifth? starting from here, the B, going up to the F, one, two, three, four, five, six. And of course, if I went the other way, I'd also come up with the same semitone count. So right away, looking at this information, I know that these are gonna sound like very different kinds of fifth, because one of them is larger than the other. That's inescapable to my ear. So you might think at this point, then, that 
diatonic interval size is useless because, I mean, if we can't distinguish in our music terminology between a consonant interval and a dissonant interval, well, why are we bothering with this? We're bothering with it for several very good reasons. To be able to recognize basic diatonic interval size immediately, instantaneously at sight, is a powerful tool. But what's going to make it work is if we start to pay attention to the context in which it takes place. Now, I've just been giving you a context that just involves a clef, so I know which notes I'm working with, but I'm going to start talking now about a different kind of context. And to do that, what I'm interested in looking at is this issue of that isolated E back in the original melody. Now, melodies, especially if they're well-written melodies, every single note in a melody plays a crucial role in contributing to the melody as a whole. I mean, if I were just to take a simple example like O Canada, and I didn't bother to put in that, I'd say, well, I, I'm missing a very important note here. I, I need that note to be part of the melody. But one of the things that we shouldn't lose track of is that even if every note in a melody can play a crucial role in it, nonetheless, it isn't always the same rule. Some melodic notes stand out more than others. Some have, uh, I would say, more of a structural role in terms of how we hear things. Now, if we go back to this tune and we think about the choreography of stepwise motion and motion by leap, one of the first things I pointed out was this segment here, that there is a lengthy segment of stepwise motion that in fact is isolated by big leaps, now we can say a leap of a fifth, on either side. So if I play that just by itself, to my ear, this B is standing out from all of these other notes. It's almost like these are an elaboration in some sense of that B. The B is a point of departure and a goal of motion for all of that stepwise motion. So if we have pitches that function clearly as either a goal of motion or a point of departure or both of those things at once, as we have here, we can say that the pitch is providing some kind of focus to the melodic contour. We call it a focal pitch. So I would say, in this local context, B, since it's both a point of departure and a goal of motion, and it does seem to be very consciously collected together in stepwise motion, B is a focal pitch. However, if I step back from the melody and look at it as a whole, I can't also help noticing that this E which is isolated on either side of that stepwise motion component, returns at the very end. And so in some sense, what my ear is hearing is not just a series of notes, a series of pitches, a series of intervals that are formed by those pitches. I'm actually hearing at the same time all of this melodic activity taking place in relation to a kind of oral horizon line. So that as the melody plays, now I'm being a little bit absurd by literally providing that E throughout while all of these other intervals are taking place. But what I'm trying to show you is how my ear is actually creating a kind of deeper picture of the melody as it develops. So my mind isn't just taking in notes and then forgetting about them. It's a little bit like, I remember times when I've been out hiking or camping and I come across a, a, a cabin out in the woods somewhere and maybe there's dirt around the outside of the cabin or it could be snow. Uh, and you can see where 
rain or melting snow tends to drain off the roof of the cabin. So rather than there being like a consistent trench of equal raindrops or, or, or melted snow drops all the way around, there tend to be these kinds of clusters that form where the water tends to fall most regularly. So it's kind of like the, the ground or the snow packs surrounding the cabin is something that registers where things tend to be placed over time. It creates a gradual collective picture of all of these individual uh, water drops. And that's something that our mind does when we listen to melodies. Over time, gradually, our ear is kind of picking up on information that gradually collects in a way and forms an impression of an underlying collection of notes that are being used, specifically pitches, pitches specific to a particular melody, but also in another way, the kind of interval relationships that connect them. By that, I don't mean these literal intervals, step, 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 lead by fifth, up by fourth, but it's as if they form a kind of interval staircase that this melodic choreography is taking place on top of. I'm gonna show you quite precisely what I mean in just a moment. I want to note that in this tune, it seems as if there isn't just one focal pitch, a B, there seems to be another one, E, which is even more focal because ultimately it creates the framework for the melody as a whole. And therefore, if I happen to try to summarize what this melody was doing, Specifically, what it was doing to my mind, as my mind subconsciously collects this information, I could represent that in this fashion. These are literally the pitches that are being used by the melody. And all I've done is write them in ascending sequence. And that's easily done because uh, this framing pitch, E, happens to be the lowest pitch in this case, and everything else moves around up there. Um, what the melody is doing is kind of performing a choreography on top of this interval staircase, right? E, B, C, B, A, G, A, B, E, A, G, F sharp, E, right? And I have semitones there and there. Everything else is whole tones. So, what I'm noticing then is not just a literal melody that's there, but an underlying structure that other melodies could make use of as well. Now, if I look at this particular melody, however, I'm struck by the fact that the choreography of motion by leap and stepwise motion does seem intent on both isolating two focal pitches, E and B, and also never bringing them directly together through stepwise motion. So for example, here we have this initial leap up to B. It's a pretty substantial leap. In the case of this melody, that's the biggest leap that we have, that fifth. There's all this stepwise motion. Look at all these friends that this B has as it moves stepwise around in a nice little curl, if you like that. We leap back down to E, and then the next time we take a leap up, we don't manage to get all the way up to B again. We only get up to A. Rather than leaping up by fifth, we've only been able to leap up a fourth. We miss that connection, and so the stepwise connection that we can make for E only reaches this far. There's no stepwise connection, no set of friends linking this E with that B. So two focal pitches, ultimately one appears to be the most focal pitch, the ultimate point of departure and goal of motion for the melody as a whole. There is another focal pitch, but it's being kept kind of in its own melodic world, if you will. Now, I can tell you what the original text for this tune was. It was as following the uh, the context is a, a piece called a motet. The text is, O oh, you who pass by, have you seen any sorrow like my sorrow? 
So think about that text for a moment. Oh, you who pass by, you who are walking away over there, um, have you seen any sorrow like I experience, like I know, like I have? So I get a sense of isolation in the text itself, that there's someone who is feeling alone with their sadness, with their sorrow, with their suffering, that in some sense there are spectators out there, but I'm not getting a sense of them taking any interest. They're just kind of passing by. And so in a way, all of that activity out there emphasizes all the more the sense of aloneness and alienation of the person singing this song. And so in a way, the structure of the melody itself captures that very idea, that very feeling, just through the combination of motion by step and motion by leap in and of itself. Now, what I want to do next is make a mistake. Because I'm saying that the melody is not just about that literal contour, but specifically the series of intervals that I hear in relation to this most vocal pitch. What I'm going to do now is play the melody another time, but I'm going to introduce a wrong note. And so see if you can hear where I make my mistake. Here we go. Now, in some senses, I might have made the music even more sad. Uh, what I did was make a mistake here. Instead of F sharp, I played F natural. So you could say, well, all he did was play a wrong note, which is true. I did play a wrong note, but I did something more than just put in a wrong note. I shifted the overall context of the tune in a significant way. If I were to play nothing but wrong notes, could I still come up with the same melody? So, for example, what I played there was an F natural rather than an F sharp. F natural is a semitone below F sharp. What if I wrote out the melody as nothing but wrong notes, but that every single one of those wrong notes was a semitone below what it should have been. What would happen? Well, all I have to do is rewrite the same melody, but just add flats to everything. And by the way, at least with respect to Bach, that's what Bach did. This thing beginning and ending on E, that's, that's not Bach. That's me trying to keep things a little bit more simple. I'm writing it out in a way that Bach had it notated. Also, there's another version of it, and harmonically equivalent, where this most focal pitch is D sharp. Talk more about that stuff in another context. Right now, all I want to do is reproduce the melody, and I'm going to show you by putting in all these flats that you will know every single note is wrong. Also, however, every single note is wrong by precisely a semitone. Courtesy accidental. Not necessary, but it helps people understand. I don't need to write natural here because there is no F sharp before. In this context, that's just F. If I wanted an F natural there, uh, actually, also because there's no F sharp before, I wouldn't have needed it. But I'm, I am getting an F natural, such as had been an error in the previous rendition. So now I'm going to play this for us. sounds A-OK. -okay. Why? I still have a sense of the same melodic structure. A most focal pitch, which is E flat, 
and then the collection as a whole happens to be this. So visually, you can see how everything is precisely a semitone below, but also you can see visually how the same underlying interval structure has been preserved. If I were to imagine each of these notes kind of in abstraction as the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth notes of the melody that it's working with, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth, I note that between the second and third notes, there's a semitone, and between the uh, fifth and the sixth, there's also a semitone, the rest all being whole tones. So the same sequence of intervals is being maintained relative to this most focal pitch. So we can introduce a new term for most focal pitch. It's a term that we're going to develop quite a lot uh, as the course develops. It's the term tonic. And the tonic which we derive from the melody, from what we hear taking place in the melody, provides, in a sense, a kind of psychological anchor for all of the melodic activity that we're going to be hearing. So that over time, what we're not hearing is just a bunch of notes, a bunch of intervals, but those unfolding in relation to our growing impression of an underlying tonic, and therefore of our sense of an interval staircase that melodic choreography is taking place on top of. Now, I do want to emphasize the fact that it is a growing impression that we have. For example, if I played this melody and I just stopped at that point, I would have a hard time recognizing E, in that case, as the most focal pitch. Because what I'm hearing is one note that seems to draw a lot of melodic attention, to generate a lot of melodic activity. It seems very important. And there's this other pitch that's beginning and ending everything, but doesn't seem connected to it in any way. By this point in time, my ear, I would say, can't decide what the most focal pitch is, what the tonic would be. I just wouldn't know. I have to, in a sense, have the puzzle solved for me by the rest of the melody for my ear to finally securely go, ah, I recognize, in this case, E is the tonic. This is the impression, then, that I have of that interval staircase. I'm going to hear melodic activity taking place in relation to this vocal, most vocal pitch, this tonic. And therefore, if that's something I can wrap my brain around, I can actually now make wonderful use of diatonic interval size. Because keep in mind that diatonic interval size is something that I can recognize very easily at sight, fifth, fourth, second, octave, what have you. But I can also get a sense of how to work with that by ear, by singing, by playing, I can think of an underlying context, an underlying interval staircase, and then perform the melodic choreography through diatonic intervals, fifth, fourth, second, third, doesn't matter. So for example, here, if I know that this is the underlying interval staircase, I can play that tune, fifth, Step, 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 down by fifth, up by fourth, step, step, step. I'm just thinking in terms of diatonic intervals on top of this. I can do that there. I could keep going. with D as a tonic. Could I do it with C sharp? How about C? How about B? So I hope
hoping you're starting to get some sense of how useful and powerful the concept of diatonic interval can be if we apply it in the correct context. The correct context has been this underlying interval staircase, we can call it. I'll now give it a name. We call it the mode of the melody. Mode being that interval sequence that our ear comes to know, that our mind comes to recognize over time as a piece of music unfolds. It's kind of like those raindrops. There are lots of individual notes that are happening, but they fall into certain particular patterns that over time create an impression through our ears in our mind. So mode is something that is extremely powerful in itself. And what I want to do in the next segment is look a little bit more closely at the idea of mode, how we can capture it by introducing some other melody. So I took us from an E version of this melody, E is the tonic, through an E flat to a D version, to a C sharp version, or D flat version to a C version, and finally to a B version. What I'm gonna do is redraw the board using the B version, and then I'm gonna introduce two more melodies that are gonna have something very significant in common with the B version of this tune. So I've written three melodies on the board. You'll recognize the first one, that's the Bach melody, except using B as its tonic. And then I've got a melody by Mozart and another tune I expect you'll recognize. I'll play each of them for you in turn. Here's the Mozart melody. melody. Which you'll probably recognize as Scarborough Fair and hopefully I don't get in trouble with the copyright police or the copyright bots or whatever they have on YouTube that Google sends out everywhere. Okay, um, three very different melodies. However, one thing that's very striking about them is that they're all working with the same collection of pitch classes, which I've summarized alphabetically up here. A, B, C sharp, D, E, F sharp, G. And you can quickly recognize that by looking at the kinds of summaries that I've provided of the notes that they're working with at the end of each of the tunes, although obviously I was running out of space here, so this represents the collection being used by Scarborough Fair, this the collection by uh, Mozart, and this the collection by Bach, even though he stole it from another composer. All right, so what I've done in each of these cases is organize that information in terms of the most focal pitch, clearly the tonic for the melody in each case. Why is that clearly the case? Well. The Bach begins and ends with B, so it's the point of departure, the goal of motion for the melody as a whole. The same thing is true for the Mozart, beginning and ending with D. And Scarborough Fair in this version, beginning, often hitting on E's in the middle, uh, and ending on E at the very end. In fact, the apex of the melodic contour, the highest point, the ceiling for the melody, uh, is E. So clearly, E is the tonic there, D is the tonic there, B is the tonic there. And what I'm doing is summarizing the collection of notes that they're working with, the collection of pitch classes. Um, it is a diatonic collection that they are working with. It's a combination of whole tones and semitones that integrates these when we summarize them from a low pitch to a high pitch. So I have a tonic, I have a diatonic, pitch class collection. I say pitch class because this is going to be true whether I literally play the melody there in that register or in any other register. This is kind of a symbolic representation of all of those registers. I can play that here. Or I could play it up here. Or down here. So the 
information that this represents conveniently within the space of just one octave is going to be true in all of these different registers. So I'm saying that for the purposes of a piece working with this, we're not just talking about this particular pitch C sharp, we're talking about the pitch class C sharp. So I've got a tonic, I have a diatonic pitch class collection, I'll just call it a diatonic collection that's being framed by that tonic, and then as a result, I have an interval relationship being established between the elements of that collection that I can call the mode. So in this case, again, if we think back to the idea of melodies having um, component parts that for now we'll identify by the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. In this case, relative to that tonic B, I have semitones occurring between uh, the second and third notes and the fifth and sixth. In this case, I have relative to that tonic of D, semitones occurring between the third and the fourth notes and the seventh and the first. I'm saying the first because I'm returning to D. In this case, Scarborough Fair, the semitones start out similar to for the Bach between the second and third notes that the melody is working with. Uh, but then, rather than being between the, the fifth and the sixth, it's between the sixth and the seventh. So in each case, what I've done is come up with a different ordering of this underlying collection. So remember, this is just the alphabetic representation. It also, of course, has its semitone relationships. But what matters is how that collection is being used, what mode is being established by each of these melodies. So we could say that each melody works with the identical diatonic collection, but because of the tonic that is particular to each melody, it's organizing that diatonic collection in a special way that's producing this feature that we call mode. And that's that kind of underlying impression that my ear gradually filters into my mind and my mind gradually builds that picture and says, okay, ultimately it's sounding like a, a this kind of melody. Because the point is that I could perform all sorts of different forms of melodic choreography on each of these underlying interval staircases on each of these modes. Um, so for example, here I can do that Mozart tune on top of this. I could also do another tune entirely. symphony. They're different melodies, but they seem to have something in common. There's a kind of musical character that is captured by this particular type of mode. Likewise, here, Scarborough Fair, uh, it has particular mode characteristics that can be shared by other melodies. Same thing with the Bach. So the idea of mode itself is something that's extremely powerful because it can be used as a kind of substrate for a huge variety of musical inspirations, musical creations. And because of that, if we start to become more sensitive to the basic features of mode, then we really empower ourselves as musicians because we can hear a tune and say, well, you know, there's a lot of information coming at me. There are a lot of details, there are a lot of intervals and all the rest of it. But I'm getting an overall impression here. It sounds like a this kind of mode, or it sounds like a that kind of mode. And if I can grab hold of that in my mind, then it kind of provides a mental filter for me. I can say, you know what? This is my general impression, uh, but I'm now able to say, all right, if it happens to be this kind of mode, I can give you a name for it. It's called a Dorian mode. I'll clarify that in the next episode. If I'm hearing something that sounds like a Dorian mode to me, then it kind of frees my mind to now pay more close attention to the granular details. I mean, what is the sequence of intervals that's taking place on top of that underlying interval staircase, on top of that mode? So what we're going to want to do in the next episode is say, is there some way 
that I can sort of generalize this information. That is to say, to come to a basic understanding of what diatonic modes are and how they are related to each other, that I can then readily call to mind when I'm encountering pieces of music and I want to understand them as quickly as possible. Or maybe I have some kind of musical inspiration that comes to me uh, while I'm out walking or uh, sitting at home at night. And I, I want to capture that. I want to write that down. But what is it sounding like to myself? Do I have to figure out each and every individual note? Well, maybe the first thing that I can do is just say, well, you know, it sounds like uh, this kind of mode. And I think that's the framework for my imagination. I'll find it that much easier to then take down my inspiration and start to create something from it. So what we're going to be doing is working with a lot of these kinds of representations. Those things are called scales. And a scale is uh, a kind of representative way of showing these mode types. So you start out with a diatonic collection. Like this. You apply a tonic to it because remember the tonic is how we are hearing that collection. We're not just hearing a series of notes and intervals. We are gradually perceiving it in relation to an underlying framework of some kind, at least in diatonic based music. So diatonic collection, apply a tonic to it. That creates a particular interval sequence that we call the mode. So these are the three things that are being neatly represented by a scale. And now what we want to do is see how these things relate to each other. Because I've already noticed that each of these is a reordering of that. And that is ultimately what mode means. It's an ordering of something. And so I have a collection of elements, and then I order it in distinctive ways. So that means that for any single collection like this, there are several possible orderings. How many are there? And why is it the case that there are that many? That's going to be a very interesting question for us to address. So we'll take that up in the next episode.